This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 38 Making them pens was a distressing tough job, and so was the saw, and Jim allowed the inscription was going to be the toughest of all. That's the one which the prisoner has to scrabble on the wall. But he had to have it. Tom said he got to. There weren't no case of a state prisoner not scrabbling his inscription to leave behind, and his coat of arms. "'Look at Lady Jane Grey,' he says. "'Look at Guilford Dudley. Look at old Northumberland. Why, Huck, suppose it is considerable trouble. What you going to do? How you going to get around it? Jim's got to do his inscription and coat of arms. They all do.' Jim says, "'Why, Mars Tom, I hain't got no coat of arm. I hain't got nothin' but dish your old shirt, and you knows I got to keep the journal on that. Oh, you don't understand, Jim. A coat of arms is very different. Well, I says, Jim's right anyway when he says he ain't got no coat of arms, because he hain't. I reckon I knowed that, Tom says, but you bet he'll have one before he goes out of this, because he's going out right and there ain't going to be no flaws in his record. So whilst me and Jim filed away at the pens on a brick bat apiece, Jim a-making his'n out of the brass, and I making mine out of the spoon, Tom set to work to think out the coat of arms. By and by he said he'd struck so many good ones he didn't hardly know which to take, but there was one which he reckoned he'd decide on. He says, on the scutcheon we'll have a bend oar in the dexter base, a saltire murray in the fess, with a dog couchant for common charge, and under his foot a chain embattled for slavery, with a chevron vert in a chief engrailed, and three invected lines on a field azure, with the nombral points rampant on a danset indented, crest a runaway nigger, sable with his bundle over his shoulder on a bar sinister, and a couple of ghouls for supporters, which is you and me, motto, Maggiore Freta, Minore Otto. Got it out of a book. Means the more haste, the less speed. Gee, willikins, I says, but what does the rest of it mean? We ain't got no time to bother over that, he says. We got to dig in like all get out. Well, anyway, I says, what's some of it? What's a fess? A fess is a, f a fess. A fess is. You don't need to know what a fess is. I'll show him how to make it when he gets to it. Shucks, Tom, I says, I think you might tell a person. What's a bar sinister? Oh, I don't know, but he's got to have it. All the nobility does. <sighs> that was just his way. If it didn't suit him to explain a thing to you, he wouldn't do it. You might pump at him a week. It would make no difference. He got all that coat of arms business fixed, so now he started in to finish up the rest of that part of the work, which was to plan out a mournful inscription. Said Jim got to have one, like they all done. He made up a lot, wrote them out on a paper, and read them off so. 1. Here a captive heart busted. 2. Here a poor prisoner, forsook by the world and friends, fretted his sorrowful life. 3. Here a lonely heart broke and a worn spirit went to its rest after thirty-seven years of solitary captivity. 4. Here, homeless and friendless, after thirty-seven years of bitter captivity, perished a noble stranger, natural son of Louis the Fourteenth. Tom's voice trembled whilst he was reading them, and he most broke down. When he got done he could no way make up his mind which one for Jim to scrabble on to the wall, 
They was all so good. But at last he allowed he would let him scrabble them all on. Jim said it would take him a year to scrabble such a lot of truck onto the logs with a nail, and he didn't know how to make them letters besides. But Tom said he would block them out for him, and then he wouldn't have nothing to do but just follow the lines. Then pretty soon he says, Come to think, the logs ain't a-going to do. They don't have log walls in a dungeon. We got to dig the inscriptions into a rock. We'll fetch a rock. Jim said the rock was worse than the logs. He said it would take him such a poison long time to dig them into a rock he wouldn't ever get out. But Tom said he would let me help him do it. Then he took a look to see how me and Jim was getting along with the pens. It was most pesky, tedious, hard work and slow, and didn't give my hands no show to get well of the sores, and we didn't seem to make no headway hardly. So Tom says, I know how to fix it. We got to have a rock for the coat of arms and mournful inscriptions, and we can kill two birds with that same rock. There's a gaudy big grindstone down at the mill, and we'll smooch it, and carve the things on it, and file out the pens and the saw on it, too. It warn't no slouch of an idea, and it warn't no slouch of a grindstone, nother, but we allowed we'd tackle it. It weren't quite midnight yet, so we cleared out for the mill, leaving Jim at work. We smooched the grindstone, and set out to roll her home, but it was a most nation-tough job. Sometimes, do what we could, we couldn't keep her from falling over, and she come mighty near mashing us every time. Tom said she was going to get one of us sure before we got through. We got her halfway and then we was plumb played out, and most drownded with sweat. We see it warn't no use, we got to go and fetch Jim. So he raised up his bed and slid the chain off of the bed leg, and wrapped it round and round his neck, and we crawled out through our hole and down there, and Jim and me laid into that grindstone and walked her along like nothing, and Tom superintended. He could out-superintend any boy I ever see. He knowed how to do everything. Our hole was pretty big, but it warn't big enough to get the grindstone through. But Jim, he took the pick and soon made it big enough. Then Tom marked out them things on it with the nail, and set Jim to work on them, with the nail for a chisel, and an iron bolt from the rubbish and the lean-to for a hammer, and told him to work till the rest of his candle quit on him, and then he could go to bed, and hide the grindstone under his straw tick, and sleep on it. Then we helped him fix his chain back on the bed leg, and was ready for bed ourselves. But Tom thought of something, and says, "'You got any spiders in here, Jim?' "'No, sir. Thanks to goodness I hain't, Mars Tom.' "'All right. We'll get you some.' "'But bless you, honey, I don't want none. I's afeard of em. I'd just soon have rattlesnakes around. Tom thought a minute or two and says, It's a good idea, and I reckon it's been done. It must have been done. It stands to reason. Yes, it's a prime good idea. Where could you keep it? Keep what, Mars Tom? Why, a rattlesnake. The goodness gracious alive, Mars Tom. Why, if there was a rattlesnake to come in here, I'd take and bust right out through that log wall, I would, with my head. Why, Jim, you wouldn't be afraid of it after a little. You could tame it. Tame it? Yes, easy enough. Every animal is grateful for kindness and petting, and they wouldn't think of hurting a person that pets them. Any book will tell you that. You try, that's all I ask, just try for two or three days. Why, you can get him so in a little while that he'll love you, and sleep with you, and won't stay away from you a minute, and will let you wrap him round your neck and put his head in your mouth. Please, Mars Tom, don't talk so. I can't stand it. He'd let me shove his head in my mouth for a favor, ain't it? I lay he'd wait a powerful long time for I asked him, and more than that, I don't want him to sleep with me. 
Jim, don't act so foolish. A prisoner's got to have some kind of a dumb pet, and if a rattlesnake hasn't ever been tried, why, there's more glory to be gained in your being the first to ever try it than any other way you could ever think of to save your life. Why, Mars Tom, I don't want no such glory. Snake take and bite Jim's chin off, then where is the glory? No, sir, I don't want no such doings. Blame it, can't you try? I only want you to try. You needn't keep it up if it don't work. But the trouble all done if the snake bite me while I's a tryin' him. Mars Tom, I'm willin' to tackle most anything that ain't unreasonable. But if you and Huck fetches a rattlesnake in here for me to tame, I's going to leave that shore. Well, then, let it go, let it go, if you're so bullheaded about it. We can get you some garter snakes, and you can tie some buttons on their tails, and let on their rattlesnakes, and I reckon that'll have to do. I can stand them, Mars Tom, but blame if I couldn't get along without em. I tell you that. I never knowed before it was so much bother and trouble to be a prisoner. Well, it always is when it's done right. You got any rats round here? No, sir, I ain't seen none. Well, we'll get you some rats. Why, Mars Tom, I don't want no rats. Dey's the dead blamest creatures to disturb a body and rustle round over em and bite his feet when he's trying to sleep I ever see. No, sir, give me God of snakes if I's got to have em, but don't give me no rats. I ain't got no use for em scarcely. But, Jim, you got to have em. They all do. So don't make no more fuss about it. Prisoners ain't ever without rats. There ain't no instance of it. And they train them and pet them and learn them tricks, and they get to be as sociable as flies. But you got to play music to them. You got anything to play music on? I ain't got nothing but a coarse comb and a piece of paper and a juice harp, but I reckon they wouldn't take no stock in a juice harp. Yes, they would. They don't care what kind of music tis. A juice harp's plenty good enough for a rat. All animals like music. In a prison they dote on it. Especially painful music and you can't get no other kind out of a Jew's harp. It always interests them. They come out to see what's the matter with you. Yes, you're all right. You're fixed very well. You want to sit on your bed nights before you go to sleep and early in the mornings and play your Jew's harp. Play The Last Link is Broken. That's the thing that'll scoop a rat quicker than anything else. And when you've played about two minutes, you'll see all the rats and the snakes and spiders and things begin to feel worried about you and come, and they'll just fairly swarm over you and have a noble good time. Yes, they will, I reckon, Mars Tom, but what kind of time is Jim having? Blessed if I can see the point. But I'll do it if I got to. I reckon I'd better keep the animals satisfied and not have no trouble in the house. Tom waited to think it over and see if there weren't nothing else, and pretty soon he says, Oh, there's one thing I forgot. Could you raise a flower here, do you reckon? I don't know, but maybe I could, Mars Tom. But it's tolerable dark in here, and I ain't got no use for no flower no how and she'd be a powerful sight of trouble. Well, you try it anyway. Some other prisoners has done it. One or dem big cattail looking mullen stalks would grow in here, Mars Tom, I reckon, but she wouldn't be worth half the trouble she'd cost. Don't you believe it. We'll fetch you a little one, and you plant it in the corner over there, and raise it. And don't call it mullen, call it pitchiola. That's its right name when it's in a prison, and you want to water it with your tears. Why, I got plenty of spring water, Mars Tom. You don't want spring water. You want to water it with your tears. It's the way they always do. Why, Mars Tom, I lay I can raise one of them mullen stalks twice with spring water whilst another man's a startin' one with tears. That ain't the idea. You got to do it with tears. 
She'll die on my hands, Mars Tom, she surely will, cause I don't scarcely ever cry. So Tom was stumped, but he studied it over, and then said Jim would have to worry along the best he could with an onion. He promised he would go to the nigger cabins and drop one, private, in Jim's coffee pot in the morning. Jim said he would just as soon have tobacco in his coffee, and found so much fault with it, and with the work and bother of raising the mullen, and Jews harping the rats, and petting and flattering up the snakes and spiders and things, on top of all the other work he had to do on pens, and inscriptions, and journals and things, which made it more trouble and worry and responsibility to be a prisoner than anything he ever undertook, that Tom most lost all patience with him, said he was just loading down with more gaudier chances than a prisoner ever had in the world to make a name for himself, and yet he didn't know enough to appreciate them, and they was just about wasted on him. So Jim, he was sorry, and said he wouldn't behave so no more, and then me and Tom shoved for bed. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 39 in the morning we went up to the village and bought a wire rat trap and fetched it down and unstopped the best rat hole and in about an hour we had fifteen of the bulliest kind of ones and then we took it and put it in a safe place under aunt sally's bed but while we was gone for spiders little thomas franklin benjamin jefferson alexander phelps found it there and opened the door of it to see if the rats would come out and they did and Aunt Sally she come in, and when we got back she was a standin' on top of the bed raising cane, and the rats was doing what they could to keep off the dull times for her. So she took and dusted us both with a hickory, and we was as much as two hours catchin' another fifteen or sixteen. Drat that meddlesome cup, and they weren't the likeliest nother, because the first haul was the pick of the flock. I never see a likelier lot of rats than what that first haul was. We got a splendid stock of sorted spiders, and bugs, and frogs, and caterpillars, and one thing or another, and we liked to got a hornet's nest, but we didn't. The family was at home. We didn't give it right up, but stayed with them as long as we could, because we allowed we'd tire them out, or they got to tire us out, and they done it. Then we got Allie Cumpain and rubbed on the places, and was pretty near all right again, but couldn't set down convenient. And so we went for the snakes, and grabbed a couple of dozen garters and house snakes, and put them in a bag, and put it in our room, and by that time it was supper time, and a rattling good honest day's work. And hungry? Oh, no, I reckon not. And there weren't a blessed snake up there when we went back. We didn't half tie the sack, and they worked out somehow and left. But it didn't matter much, because they were still on the premises somewheres. So we judged we could get some of them again. No, there weren't no real scarcity of snakes about the house for a considerable spell. You'd see them dripping from the rafters in places every now and then, and they generally landed in your plate, or down the back of your neck, and most of the time where you didn't want them. Well, they was handsome and striped, and there weren't no harm in a million of em, but that never made no difference to Aunt Sally. She despised snakes, be the breed what they might, and she couldn't stand them no way you could fix it. And every time one of them flopped down on her, it didn't make no difference what she was doin'. She would just lay that work down and light out. I never see such a woman. And you could hear her whoop to Jericho. You couldn't get her to take a hold of one of them with the tongs. And if she turned over and found one in bed, she would scramble out and lift the howl so you would think the house was afire. She disturbed the old man so that he said he could most wish there hadn't ever been no snakes created. 
why, after every last snake had been gone clear out of the house for as much as a week, Aunt Sally weren't over it yet, and she weren't near over it. When she was settin' thinkin' about something, you could touch her on the back of her neck with a feather, and she would jump right out of her stockings. It was very curious. But Tom said all women was just so. He said they was made that way, for some reason or other. We got a lickin' every time one of our snakes come in her way, and she allowed these lickin's weren't nothin' to what she would do if we ever loaded up the place again with em. I didn't mind the lickin's, because they didn't amount to nothin'. But I minded the trouble we had to lay in another lot. But we got them laid in, and all the other things, and you never see a cabin as blithesome as Jim's was when they'd all swarm out for music and go for him. Jim didn't like the spiders, and the spiders didn't like Jim, and so they'd lay for him, and make it mighty warm for him. And he said that between the rats and the snakes and the grindstone there weren't no room in bed for him scarcely, and when there was a body couldn't sleep, it was so lively, and it was always lively, he said, because they never all slept at one time, but took turn about. So when the snakes was asleep, the rats was on deck, and when the rats turned in, the snakes come on watch. So he always had one gang under him, in his way, and the other gang having a circus over him. And if he got up to hunt a new place, the spiders would take a chance at him as he crossed over. He said if he ever got out this time, he wouldn't ever be a prisoner again, not for a salary. Well, by the end of three weeks, everything was in pretty good shape. The shirt was sent in early, in a pie, and every time a rat bit Jim, he would get up and write a little in his journal while the ink was fresh. The pens was made, the inscriptions and so on was carved on the grindstone, the bed leg was sawed in two, and we had et up the sawdust, and it give us a most amazing stomach ache. We reckoned we was all going to die but didn't. It was the most undigestible sawdust I ever see, and Tom said the same. But as I was saying, we we got all the work done now, at last, and we was all pretty much fagged out, too, but mainly Jim. The old man had wrote a couple of times to the plantation below Orleans to come and get their runaway nigger, but hadn't got no answer, because there weren't no such plantation. So he allowed he would advertise Jim in the St. Louis and New Orleans papers, and when he mentioned the St. Louis ones, it give me the cold shivers, and I see we had no time to lose. So Tom said, now for the anonymous letters. What's them? I says. Warnings to the people that something is up. Sometimes it's done one way, sometimes another. But there's always somebody spying around that gives notice to the governor of the castle. When Louis the Sixteenth was going to light out of the Tuileries, a servant girl done it. It's a very good way, and so is the anonymous letters. We'll use them both. And it's usual for the prisoner's mother to change clothes with him, and she stays in, and he slides out in her clothes. We'll do that, too. But looky here, Tom, what do we want to warn anybody for that something's up? Let them find it out for themselves. It's their lookout. Yes, I know, but you can't depend on them. It's the way they've acted from the very start. Left us to do everything. They're so confiding and mullet-headed, they wouldn't take no notice of nothing at all. So if we don't give them notice, there won't be nobody nor nothing to interfere with us. And so after all our hard work and trouble, this escape will go off perfectly flat. Won't amount to nothing. Won't be nothing to it. Well, as for me, Tom, that's the way I'd like. Shucks, he says, and looked disgusted. So I says, but I ain't going to make no complaint. Any way that suits you suits me. What are you going to do about the servant girl? You'll be her. You slide in in the middle of the night and hook that yaller girl's frock. Why, Tom, that'll make trouble next morning, because, of course, she probably ain't got any but that one. 
I know, but you don't want it but fifteen minutes to carry the anonymous letter and shove it in under the front door. All right, then, I'll do it, but I could carry it just as handy in my own togs. You wouldn't look like a servant girl, then, would you? No, but there won't be nobody to see what I look like, anyway. That ain't nothing to do with it. The thing for us to do is just to do our duty, and not worry about whether anybody sees us do it or not. Ain't you got no principle at all? All right, I ain't saying nothing. I'm the servant girl. Who's Jim's mother? I'm his mother. I'll hook a gown from Aunt Sally. Well, then, you'll have to stay in the cabin when me and Jim leaves. Not much. I'll stuff Jim's clothes full of straw and lay it on his bed to represent his mother in disguise, and Jim will take the nigger woman's gown off of me and wear it, and we'll all evade together. When a prisoner of style escapes, it's called an evasion. It's always called so when a king escapes, for instance. And the same with a king's son. It don't make no difference whether he's a natural one or an unnatural one. So Tom, he wrote the anonymous letter, and I smooched the yaller wench's frock that night, and put it on, and shoved it under the front door, the way Tom told me to. It said, Beware. Trouble is brewing. Keep a sharp lookout. Unknown friend. Next night we stuck a picture, which Tom drawed in blood, of a skull and crossbones on the front door and next night another one of a coffin on the back door. I never see a family in such a sweat. They couldn't have been worth scared if the place had been full of ghosts laying for them behind everything and under the beds and shivering through the air. If a door banged, Aunt Sally, she jumped and said, Ouch! If anything fell, she jumped and said, Ouch! If you happened to touch her when she weren't noticing, she'd done the same. She couldn't face no way and be satisfied, because she allowed there was something behind her every time, so she was always a whirling around sudden and saying, Ouch! And before she'd got two-thirds around, she'd whirl back again and say it again, and she was afraid to go to bed, but she dasn't set up. So the thing was working very well, Tom said. He said he never see a thing work more satisfactory. He said it showed it was done right. So we said, now for the grand bulge. So the very next morning at the streak of dawn we got another letter ready, and was wondering what we better do with it, because we heard them say at supper they was going to have a nigger on watch at both doors all night. Tommy went down the lightning rod to spy around, and the nigger at the back door was asleep, and he stuck it in the back of his neck and come back. This letter said, Don't betray me. I wish to be your friend. There is a desperate gang of cutthroats from over in the Indian Territory, going to steal your runaway nigger to-night, and they have been trying to scare you so as you will stay in the house and not bother them. I am one of the gang, but have got religion, and wish to quit it and lead an honest life again, and will betray the hellish design. They will sneak down from Northard's along the fence, at midnight exact, with a false key, and go in the nigger's cabin to get him. I am to be off a piece and blow a tin horn if I see any danger, but stead of that I will ba like a sheep soon as they get in and not blow at all. Then whilst they are getting his chains loose, you slip there and lock them in, and can kill them at your leisure. Don't do anything but just the way I am telling you. If you do, they will suspicion something, and raise whoop jamboree who. I do not wish any reward, but to know I have done the right thing. Unknown Friend End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. 
The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 40 We was feeling pretty good after breakfast, and took my canoe and went over the river a-fishing, with a lunch, and had a good time, and took a look at the raft and found her all right, and got home late to supper, and found them in such a sweat and worry they didn't know which end they was standing on, and made us go right off to bed the minute we was done supper, and wouldn't tell us what the trouble was, and never let on a word about the new letter, but didn't need to, because we knowed as much about it as anybody did. And as soon as we was half upstairs and her back was turned, we slid for the cellar cupboard, and loaded up a good lunch, and took it up to our room and went to bed, and got up about half-past eleven, and Tom put on Aunt Sally's dress that he stole and was going to start with the lunch, but says, "'Where's the butter?' "'I laid out a hunk of it,' I says, "'on a piece of a corn-bone.' "'Well, you left it laid out, then. It ain't here.' "'We can get along without it,' I says. "'We can get along with it, too,' he says. "'Just you slide down cellar and fetch it and then mosey right down the lightning rod and come along. I'll go and stuff the straw into Jim's clothes to represent his mother in disguise, and be ready to buy like a sheep and shove soon as you get there. So out he went, and down cellar went I. The hunk of butter, big as a person's fist, was where I had left it, so I took up the slab of corn-pone with it on, and blowed out my light, and started upstairs very stealthy, and got up to the main floor all right. But here comes Aunt Sally with a candle, and I clapped the truck in my hat and clapped my hat on my head, and the next second she see me, and she says, "'You been down cellar?' "'Yes'm.' "'What you been doing down there?' "'Nothing.' "'Nothing?' "'No, am "'Well, then, what possessed you to go down there this time of night?' "'I, I don't know em. You don't know. Don't answer me that way. Tom, I want to know what you've been doing down there. I ain't been doing a single thing, Aunt Sally. I hope to gracious if I have. I reckon she'd let me go now, and as a general thing, she would. But I suppose there were so many strange things going on, she just in a sweat about every little thing that weren't yardstick straight. So she says, very decided, you just march into that settin' room and stay there till I come. You've been up to something you've no business to, and I lay I'll find out what it is before I'm done with you. So she went away as I opened the door and walked into the settin' room. My, but there was a crowd there. Fifteen farmers, and every one of them had a gun. I was most powerful sick, and slunk to a chair and sat down. They was settin' around, some of them talkin' a little in a low voice, and all of them fidgety and uneasy, but tryin' to look like they weren't. But I knowed they was, because they was always takin' off their hats and puttin' them on, and scratchin' their heads and changin' their seats and fumblin' with their buttons. I warn't easy myself, but I didn't take my hat off all the same. I did wish Aunt Sally would come and get done with me, and lick me if she wanted to, and let me get away and tell Tom how we'd overdone this thing, and what a thundering hornet's nest we'd a got ourselves into, so we could stop foolin' around straight off and clear out with Jim before these rips got out of the patience and come for us. At last she come and begun to ask me questions, but I couldn't answer them straight. I didn't know which end of me was up because these men was in such a fidget now that some was wantin' to start right now and lay for them desperados, and sayin' it warn't but a few minutes to midnight, and others was trying to get them to hold on and wait for the sheep signal, and here was Auntie pecking away at the questions, and me a-shakin' all over and ready to sink down in my tracks I was that scared, and the place gettin' hotter and hotter, and the butter beginning to melt and run down my neck and behind my ears. And pretty soon, when one of them says, I'm for going and getting in the cabin first and right now, and catching them when they come, I most dropped, and a streak of butter come a-trickling down my forehead, and Aunt Sally, she see it, 
and turns white as a sheet, and says, "'For the land's sake, what is the matter with the child? He's got the brain fever as sure as you're born, and they're oozing out.' And everybody runs to see, and she snatches off my hat, and out comes the bread and what was left of the butter, and she grabbed me and hugged me and says, "'Oh, what a turn you did give me! And how glad and grateful I am it ain't no worse! For luck's against us, and it never rains but it pours. And when I see that truck I thought we'd lost you, for I knowed by the color and all it was just like your brains would be if— Dear, dear, why didn't you tell me that was what you'd been down there for? I wouldn't a cared. Now clear out to bed, and don't let me see no more of you till morning. I was upstairs in a second, and down the lightning rod in another one, and shinning through the dark for the lean-to. I couldn't hardly get my words out, I was so anxious, but I told Tom as quick as I could we must jump for it now, and not a minute to lose. The house was full of men yonder, with guns. His eyes just blazed, and he says, No, is that so? Ain't it bully? Why, Huck, if it was to do over again, I bet I could fetch two hundred. If we could put it off till— Hurry, hurry, I says. Where's Jim? Right at your elbow. If you reach out your arm, you can touch him. He's dressed and everything's ready. Now we'll slide out and give the sheep signal. But then we heard the tramp of men coming to the door, and heard them beginning to fumble with the padlock, and heard a man say, I told you we'd be too soon. They haven't come. The door is locked. Here, I'll lock some of you into the cabin. You lay for em in the dark and kill em when they come, and the rest scatter round a piece, and listen if you can hear em coming. So in they come, but couldn't see us in the dark, and most trod on us whilst we was hustling to get under the bed. But we got under all right, and out through the hole, swift but soft, Jim first, me next, and Tom last, which was according to Tom's orders. Now we was in the lean-to, and heard trampings close by outside. So we crept to the door, and Tom stopped us there and put his eye to the crack. But couldn't make out nothing, it was so dark, and whispered and said he would listen for the steps to get further, and when he nudged us, Jim must glide out first, and him last. So he set his ear to the crack and listened, and listened, and listened, and the steps are scraping around out there all the time, and at last he nudged us and we slid out, and stooped down, not breathing, and not making the least noise, and slipped stealthy towards the fence and engine file, and got to it all right, and me and Jim over it. But Tom's breeches catch fast on a splinter on the top rail, and then he hear the steps coming, so he had a pull loose, which snapped the splinter and made a noise. And as he dropped in our tracks and started, somebody sings out, "'Who's that? Answer, or I'll shoot!' But we didn't answer. We just unfurled our heels and shoved. Then there was a rush and a bang, 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 and the bullets fairly whizzed around us. We heard them sing out, "'Here they are! They broke for the river! After em, boys, and turn loose the dogs!' So here they come, full tilt. We could hear them because they wore boots and yelled, but we didn't wear no boots and didn't yell. We was in the path to the mill, and when they got pretty close on to us, we dodged into the bush and let them go by, and then dropped in behind them. They'd had all the dogs shut up, so they wouldn't scare off the robbers, but by this time somebody had let them loose, and here they come, making powwow enough for a million. But they was our dogs so we stopped in our tracks till they catched up. And when they see it warn't nobody but us, and no excitement to offer them, they only just said, Howdy, and tore right ahead towards the shouting and clattering, and then we up steam again, and whizzed along after them till we was nearly to the mill, and then struck up through the bush to where my canoe was tied, and hopped in and pulled for dear life towards the middle of the river but didn't make no more noise than we was obliged to. Then we struck out, easy and comfortable, for the island where my raft was, 
and we could hear them yelling and barking at each other all up and down the bank, till we was so far away the sounds got dim and died out. And when we stepped on to the raft I says, "'Now, old Jim, you're a free man again, and I bet you won't ever be a slave no more.' And a mighty good job it was, too, Huck. It is planned beautiful, and it was done beautiful, and they ain't nobody can get up a plan that's more mixed up and splendid than what dat one was. We was all glad as we could be, but Tom was the gladdest of all because he had a bullet in the calf of his leg. When me and Jim heard that, we didn't feel so brash as what we did before. It was hurting him considerable, and bleeding, so we laid him in the wigwam and tore up one of the duke's shirts for uh, to bandage him, but he says, "'Give me the rags. I can do it myself. Don't stop now. Don't fool around here, and the evasion boobin' along so handsome. Man the sweeps, and set her loose. Boys, we done it elegant. Deed we did. I wish we'd a had the handling of Louis sixteen and there wouldn't have been no son of St. Louis ascend to heaven, wrote down in his biography. No, sir, we'd a whooped him over the border. That's what we'd a done with him, and done it just as slick as nothing at all, too. Man the sweeps! Man the sweeps! But me and Jim was consulting and thinking, and after we'd thought a minute, I says, Say it, Jim. So he says, well, then, this is the way it looked to me, Huck. If it was him that has been sought free, and one of the boys was to get shot, would he say, Go on and save me, never mind about a doctor for to save this one? Is dat like Mars Tom Sawyer? Would he say dat? You bet he wouldn't. Well, then, is Jim going to say it? No, sir, I don't budge a step out in this place without a doctor, not if it's forty year. I knowed he was white inside, and I reckon he'd say what he did say. So it was all right now, and I told Tom I was a-goin' for a doctor. He raised considerable row about it, but me and Jim stuck to it, and wouldn't budge. So he was for crawlin' out and settin' the raft loose hisself, but we wouldn't let him. Then he give us a piece of his mind, but it didn't do no good. So when he sees me getting the canoe ready, he says, "'Well, then, if you're bound to go, I'll tell you the way to do when you get to the village. Shut the door and blindfold the doctor tight and fast, and make him swear to be silent as the grave, and put a purse full of gold in his hand, and then take and lead him all around the back alleys and everywheres in the dark, and then fetch him here in the canoe, in a roundabout way amongst the islands.' and search him and take his chalk away from him, and don't give it back to him till you get him back to the village, or else he will chalk this raft so he can find it again. It's the way they all do. So I said I would, and left, and Jim was to hide in the woods when he see the doctor coming, till he was gone again. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 41 The doctor was an old man, a very nice, kind-looking old man when I got him up. I told him me and my brother was over on Spanish Island, hunting yesterday afternoon, and camped on a piece of a raft we found, and about midnight he must have kicked his gun in his dreams, for it went off and shot him in the leg, and we wanted him to go over there and fix it and not say nothing about it, nor let anybody know, because we wanted to come home this evening and surprise the folks. "'Who is your folks?' he says. "'The Phelps is down yonder.' "'Oh!' he says. And after a minute he says, "'How'd you say he got shot?' "'He had a dream,' I says, "'and it shot him.' "'Singular dream,' he says. 
So he lit up his lantern and got his saddlebags, and we started. But when he seized the canoe, he didn't like the look of her. Said she was big enough for one, but didn't look pretty safe for two. I says, Oh, you needn't be afeard, sir. She carried the three of us easy enough. What three? Why, me and Sid and... and... and the guns, that's what I mean. Oh, he says. But he put his foot on the gunwale and rocked her, and shook his head, and said he reckoned he'd look around for a bigger one. But they was all locked and chained, so he took my canoe, and said for me to wait till he come back, or I could hunt around further, and maybe I better go down home and get them ready for the surprise if I wanted to. But I said I didn't so I told him just how to find the raft, and then he started. I struck an idea pretty soon. I says to myself, supposing he can't fix that leg just in three shakes of a sheep's tail, as the saying is. Supposing it takes him three or four days. What are we going to do? Lay around there till he lets the cat out of the bag? No, sir. I know what I'll do. I'll wait and when he comes back, if he says he's got to go any more, I'll get down there, too, if I swim, and we'll take and tie him, and keep him, and shove out down the river, and when Tom's done with him, we'll give him what it's worth, or all we got, and then let him get ashore. So then I crept into a lumber pile to get some sleep, and next time I waked up, the sun was away up over my head. I shot out and went for the doctor's house, but they told me he'd gone away in the night some time or other, and weren't back yet. Well, thinks I, that looks powerful bad for Tom, and I'll dig out for the island right off. So away I shoved, and turned the corner, and nearly ran my head into Uncle Silas's stomach. He says, oh, Why, Tom, where you been all this time, you rascal? I ain't been nowheres. I says, only just hunting for the runaway nigger, me and Sid. Why, wherever did you go? He says, your aunt's been mighty uneasy. She needn't, I says, because we was all right. We followed the men and the dogs, but they outrun us, and we lost them. But we thought we heard them on the water, so we got a canoe and took out after them and crossed over, but couldn't find nothing of them. So we cruised along up shore till we got kind of tired and beat out, and tied up the canoe and went to sleep, and never waked up until about an hour ago. Then we paddled over here to hear the news, and Sid's at the post office to see what he can hear, and I'm a-branching out to get something to eat for us, and then we're going home. So then we went to the post office to get Sid, but just as I suspicioned, he weren't there. So the old man he got a letter out of the office, and we waited a while longer, but Sid didn't come. So the old man said, Come along, let Sid foot it home, or canoe it, when he got done fooling around. But we would ride. I couldn't get him to let me stay and wait for Sid, and he said there weren't no use in it, and I must come along, and let Aunt Sally see we was all right. When we got home, Aunt Sally was that glad to see me, she laughed and cried both, and hugged me, and give me one of them lickings of hern that don't amount to shucks, and said she'd serve Sid the same when he come. And the place was plumb full of farmers and farmers' wives to dinner, and such another clack a body never heard. Old Mrs. Hotchkiss was the worst, her tongue was a-going all the time, she says, well, Sister Phelps, I ransacked that air cabin over, and I believe the nigger was crazy. I says to Sister Damrell, didn't I, Sister Damrell? Says I, he's crazy, says I. Them's the very words I said. You all heard me, he's crazy, says I. Everything shows it, says I. Look at that air grindstone, says I. Want to tell me it any creature in his right mind is going to scrabble all them crazy things onto a grindstone, says I. Here's such and such a person busted his heart, and here's so and so pegged along for thirty-seven year, and all that, natural son of Louis somebody, and such everlasting rubbage. He's plumb crazy, says I. It's what I says in the first place, it's what I says in the middle, and it's what I says last and all the time. The nigger's crazy. Crazy Nebuchadnezzar, says I. 
"'And look at that air ladder made out of rags, Sister Hotchkiss,' says old Mrs. Damrell. "'Why, in the name of goodness, could he ever want of?' "'The very words I was a-saying no longer go this minute to Sister Utterback, and she'll tell you so herself,' says she. "'Look at that air rag ladder,' says she. And says I, "'Yes, look at it,' says I. "'What could he a wanted of it?' says I. Says she, "'Sister Hotchkiss,' says she, "'But how in the nation they ever get that grindstone in there anyway? And who dug that air hole? And who—' "'My very words, Brer Penrod, I was a saying, "'Pass that air sasser of molasses, won't you? "'I was a saying to Sister Dunlap just this minute. "'How did they get that grindstone in there?' says I. "'Without help, mind you, without help. "'That's where it is. "'Don't tell me,' says I. "'There was help,' says I. "'And there was a plenty help, too,' says I. "'There been a dozen helpin' that nigger, "'and I lay I'd skin every last nigger on this place, "'but I'd find out who done it,' says I. "'And moreover,' says I, "'a dozen,' says you. Forty couldn't have done everything that's been done. Look at them case-knife saws and things. How tedious they've been made. Look at that bed-leg sawed off with them. A week's work for six men. Look at that nigger made out of straw on the bed, and look at— Well, you may say it, Br'er Hightower. It's just as I was saying to Br'er Phelps, his own self. Says he, What do you think of it, Sister Hotchkiss? Says he, Think of what, Br'er Phelps? Says I. Think of that bed leg sawed off that away, says he. Think of it, says I. I lay it never sawed itself off, says I. Somebody sawed it, says I. That's my opinion. Take it or leave it. It may be no count, says I. But such as it is, it's my opinion, says I. And if anybody can start a better one, says I, let him do it, says I. That's all. I says to Sister Dunlap, says I. Why, dog my cats, there must have been a house full of niggers in there every night for four weeks to a done all that work, Sister Phelps. Look at that shirt, every last inch of it covered over with secret African writing done with blood. Must have been a raft of em at it right along, all the time almost. Why, I'd give two dollars to have it read to me, and as for the niggers that wrote it, I'd low I'd take and lash em until— People to help him, Brother Marples. Well, I reckon you'd think so if you'd have been in this house for a while back. Why, they stole everything they could lay their hands on, and we a watchin' all the time, mind you. They stole that shirt right off of the line, and as for that sheet, they made the rag ladder out of. There ain't no tellin' how many times they didn't steal that, and flour, and candles, and candlesticks and spoons, and the old warming-pan, and most a thousand things that I disremember now, and my new calico dress, and me and Silas, and my Sid and Tom on the constant watch day and night, as I was a-tellin' you, and not a one of us could catch hide nor hair, nor sight nor sound of them, and here, at the last minute, lo and behold you, they slides right in under our noses and fools us and not only fools us, but the Injun Territory robbers, too, and actually gets away with that nigger safe and sound, and that with sixteen men and twenty-two dogs right on their very heels at that very time. I tell you, it just bangs anything I ever heard of. Why, spirits couldn't have done better and been no smarter. And I reckon they must have been spirits, because you know our dogs, and there ain't no better. Well, them dogs never even got on the track of em once. You explain that to me if you can, any of you. Well, it does be— Laws alive, I never— So help me, I wouldn't have be... House thieves as well as— Them this gracious sakes, I'd have been afeard to live in such a— Afraid to live? Why, I was that scared I doesn't hardly go to bed or get up, or lay down, or set down, Sister Ridgeway. Why, they'd steal the very—why, goodness sakes, you can guess what kind of a fluster I was in by the time midnight come last night. I hoped to gracious if I weren't afraid they'd steal some of the family. I was just to that pass I didn't have no reasoning faculties no more. It looks foolish enough now, in the daytime, but I says to myself— 
there's my two poor boys asleep way upstairs in that lonesome room, and I declare to goodness I was that uneasy that I crept up there and locked em in. I did, and anybody would, because, you know, when you get scared that way, and it keeps running on, and getting worse and worse all the time, and your wits get to addling, and you get to doing all sorts of wild things, and by and by you think to yourself, supposing I was a boy, and was away up there, and the door ain't locked, and you—' She stopped, looking kind of wondering, and then she turned her head around slow, and when her eye lit on me, I got up and took a walk. Says I to myself, I can't explain better how we come to not be in that room this morning if I go out to one side and study over it a little. So I done it. But I dasn't go fur, or she'd a sent for me. And when it was late in the day the people all went, and when I come in and told her the noise and shooting waked up me and Sid, and the door was locked, and we wanted to see the fun, so we went down the lightning rod, and both of us got hurt a little, and we didn't never want to try that no more. And then I went on and told her all what I told Uncle Silas before, and then she said she'd forgive us, and maybe it was all right enough anyway, and about what a body might expect of boys, for all boys was a pretty harem scarum lot as fur as she could see. And so, as long as no harm hadn't come of it, she judged she better put in her time being grateful we was alive and well, and she had us still, stead of fretting over what was past and done. So then she kissed me, and patted me on the head, and dropped into a kind of a brown study, and pretty soon jumps up, and says, "'Why, laws the mercy, it's most night, and Sid not come yet. What has become of that boy?' I see my chance, so I skips up and says, I'll run right up to town and get him, I says. No, you won't, she says. You'll stay right where you are. One's enough to be lost at a time. If he ain't here to supper, your uncle'll go. Well, he weren't there to supper, so right after supper uncle went. He come back about ten a little bit uneasy, hadn't run across Tom's track. Aunt Sally was a good deal uneasy, but Uncle Silas, he said there won't no occasion to be. Boys will be boys, he said, and you'll see this one turn up in the morning all sound and right. So she had to be satisfied, but she said she'd set up for him a while anyway, and keep a light burning so he could see it. And then when I went up to bed she come up with me, and fetched her candle and tucked me in, and mothered me so good. I felt mean, and like I couldn't look her in the face, and she sat down on the bed and talked with me a long time, and said what a splendid boy Sid was, and didn't seem to want to ever stop talking about him. He kept asking me every now and then if I reckon he could have got lost or hurt or maybe drowned, and might be laying at this minute somewhere suffering or dead, and she not by him to help him, and so the tears would drip down silent and I would tell her that Sid was all right, and would be home in the morning, sure, and she would squeeze my hand, or maybe kiss me, and tell me to say it again, and keep on saying it, because it done her good, and she was in so much trouble. And when she was going away, she looked down in my eyes so steady and gentle, and says, The door ain't going to be locked, Tom, and there's the window and the rod, but you'll be good, won't you? And you won't go? For my sake. Laws knows I wanted to go bad enough to see about Tom, and was all intending to go, but after that I wouldn't a went, not for kingdoms. But she was on my mind, and Tom was on my mind, so I slept very restless, and twice I went down the rod away in the night, and slipped around front, and see her settin' there by her candle in the window, with her eyes towards the road, and the tears in them. And I wished I could do something for her, but I couldn't, only to swear that I would not never do nothing to grieve her any more. And the third time I waked up at dawn, and slid down, and she was there yet, and her candle was most out, and her old gray head was restin' on her hand, 
and she was asleep. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 42 The old man was uptown again before breakfast, but couldn't get no track of Tom and both of them sat at the table thinking, and not saying nothing, and looking mournful, and their coffee getting cold, and not eating anything. And by and by the old man says, Did I give you the letter? What letter? The one I got yesterday out of the post office. No, you didn't give me no letter. Well, I, I must have forgot it. So he rummaged his pockets, and then went off somewheres where he had laid it down, and fetched it and give it to her. She says, "'Why, it's from St. Petersburg. It's from Sis.' I allowed another walk would do me good, but I couldn't stir. But before she could break it open she dropped it and run, for she see something. And so did I. It was Tom Sawyer on a mattress, and that old doctor and Jim in her calico dress with his hands tied behind him, and a lot of people. I hid the letter behind the first thing that come handy, and rushed. She flung herself at Tom, crying, and says, Oh, he's dead, he's dead, I know he's dead. And Tom, he turned his head a little, and muttered something or other, which showed he weren't in his right mind. Then she flung up her hands and says, He's alive, thank God, and that's enough and she snatched a kiss of him, and flew for the house to get the bed ready, and scattering orders right and left at the niggers and everybody else, as fast as her tongue could go, every jump of the way. I followed the men to see what they was going to do with Jim, and the old doctor and Uncle Silas followed after Tom into the house. The men was very huffy, and some of them wanted to hang Jim for an example to all the other niggers around there so they wouldn't be trying to run away like Jim done, and making such a raft of trouble, keeping a whole family scared most to death for days and nights. But the others said, Don't do it. It wouldn't answer at all. He ain't our nigger, and his owner would turn up and make us pay for him, sure. So that cooled them down a little, because the people that's always the most anxious for to hang a nigger that hain't done just right, is always the very ones that ain't the most anxious to pay for em when they've got their satisfaction out of him. They cussed Jim considerable, though, and give him a cuff or two side the head once in a while. But Jim never said nothing, and he never let on to know me. And they took him to the same cabin, and put his own clothes on him, and chained him again, not to no bed leg this time, but to a big staple drove into the bottom log, and chained his hands, too, and both legs, and said he weren't to have nothing but bread and water to eat after this till his owner come, or he was sold at auction because he didn't come in a certain length of time, and filled up our hole, and said a couple of farmers with guns must stand watch around about the cabin every night, and a bulldog tied to the door in the daytime, and about this time they was through with the job and was tapering off with a kind of general good-bye cussin. Then the old doctor comes and takes a look and says, "'Don't be no rougher on him than you're obliged to, because he ain't a bad nigger. When I got to where I found the boy, I see I couldn't cut the bullet out without some help, and he warn't no condition for me to leave to go and get help. And he got a little worse and a little worse, and after a long time he went out of his head.' and wouldn't let me come anigh him any more, and said if I chalked his raft he'd kill me, and no end of wild foolishness like that, and I see I couldn't do anything at all with him, so I says, I got to have help somehow, and the minute I says it, out crawls this nigger from somewheres and says, he'll help, and he done it too, and done it very well. Of course I judged he must be a runaway nigger, and there I was. 
and there I had to stick right straight along all through the rest of the day and all night. It was a fix, I tell you. I had a couple of patients with the chills, and of course I'd have liked to run up to town and see them, but I dasn't, because the nigger might get away, and then I'd be to blame, and yet never a skiff come close enough for me to hail. So there I had to stick plumb until daylight this morning, and I never see a nigger that was a better nuss or a faithfuller, and yet he was risking his freedom to do it, and was all tired out too, and I see plain enough he'd worked mean hard lately. I like the nigger for that. I tell you, gentlemen, a nigger like that is worth a thousand dollars, and kind treatment, too. I had everything I needed, and the boy was doing as well there as he would have done at home. Better, maybe, because it was so quiet. But there I was, with both of them on my hands, and there I had to stick till about dawn this morning. Then some men in a skiff come by, and as good luck would have it, the nigger was settin' by the pallet with his head propped on his knees, sound asleep. So I motioned them in quiet, and they slipped up on him and grabbed him and tied him before he knowed what he was about, and we never had no trouble. And the boy been in a kind of a flighty sleep, too, we muffled the oars and hitched the raft on and towed her over very nice and quiet, and the nigger never made the least row nor said a word from the start. He ain't no bad nigger, gentlemen. That's what I think about him. Somebody says. Well, it sounds very good, doctor, I'm obliged to say. Then the others softened up a little, too, and I was mighty thankful to that old doctor for doing Jim that good turn, and I was glad it was according to my judgment of him, too, because I thought he had a good heart in him, and was a good man the first time I see him. Then they all agreed that Jim had acted very well, and was deserving to have some notice took of it and reward. So every one of them promised, right out and hearty, that they wouldn't cuss him no more. Then they come out and locked him up. I was hoping they was going to say he could have one or two of the chains took off, because they was rotten heavy, or could have meat and greens with his bread and water, but they didn't think of it, and I reckon it weren't best for me to mix in but I judged I'd get the doctor's yarn to Aunt Sally somehow or other as soon as I got through the breakers that was laying just ahead of me. Explanations, I mean, of how I forgot to mention about Sid being shot when I was telling how him and me put in that dratted night paddling round hunting the runaway nigger. But I had plenty time. Aunt Sally, she stuck to the sick room all day and all night, and every time I see Uncle Silas mooning around, I dodged him. Next morning I heard Tom was a good deal better, and they said Aunt Sally was gone to get a nap. So I slips to the sick room, and if I found him awake I reckoned we could put up a yarn for the family that would wash. But he was sleeping, and sleeping very peaceful, too, and pale, not fire-faced the way he was when he come. So I sat down and laid for him to wake. In about half an hour Aunt Sally comes gliding in, and there I was, up a stump again. She motioned me to be still, and sat down by me, and begun to whisper, and said we could all be joyful now, because all the symptoms was first-rate, and he'd been sleeping like that for ever so long, and looking better and peacefuller all the time, and ten to one he'd wake up in his right mind. So we sat there watching, and by and by he stirs a bit, and opens his eyes very natural, takes a look and says, "'Hello. Why, I'm at home. How's that? Where's the raft?' "'It's all right,' I says. "'And Jim?' "'The same,' I says, but I couldn't say it pretty brash. But he never noticed, but says, "'Good. Splendid. Now we're all right and safe. Did you tell Annie?' I was going to say yes, but she chipped in and says, "'About what, Sid?' "'Why, about the way the whole thing was done.' "'What whole thing?' "'Why, the whole thing. There ain't but one. How we set the runaway nigger free, me and Tom?' "'Good land! Set the run! What is the child talking about? Dear, dear, out of his head again!' No, I ain't out of my head. I know all what I'm talking about. 
We did set him free, me and Tom. We laid out to do it, and we done it. And we done it elegant, too. He got a start, and she never checked him up, just sat and stared and stared and let him clip along, and I see it warn't no use for me to put in. Why, Annie, it costs us a power of work, weeks of it, hours and hours every night, whilst you was all asleep, and we had to steal candles and the sheet and the shirt and your dress, and spoons and tin plates and case knives and the warming pan and the grindstone and flour and just no end of things, and you can't think what work it was to make the saws and pens and inscriptions in one thing or another. You can't think half the fun it was. And we had to make up the pictures of coffins and things, anonymous letters from the robbers, and get up and down the lightning rod, and dig the hole into the cabin, and made the rope ladder, and sent it in cooked up in a pie, and send in spoons and things to work with in your apron pocket. Mercy sakes! and load up the cabin with rats and snakes and so on for company for jim and then you kept tom here so long with the butter in his hat that you come near spilin the whole business because the men come before we was out of the cabin and we had to rush and they hurt us and let drive at us and i got my share and we dodged out of the path and let them go by and when the dogs come they weren't interested in us but went for the most noise and we got our canoe and made for the raft, and was all safe, and Jim was a free man, and we done it all by ourselves. And wasn't it bully, Auntie? Well, I never heard the likes of it in all my born days. So it was you, you little rapscallions, that's been making all this trouble, and turned everybody's wits clean inside out, and scared us all most to death. I've as good a notion as ever I had in my life to take it out of you this very minute. To think, here I've been, night after night, and you just get well once, you young scamp, and I lay I'll tan the old Harry out of both of you. But Tom, he was so proud and joyful, he just couldn't hold in, and his tongue just went it, she a-chippin' in and spittin' fire all along and both of them going it at once, like a cat convention, and she says, "'Well, you get all the enjoyment you can out of it now, for mind I tell you, if I catch you meddling with him again—' "'Meddling with who?' Tom says, dropping his smile and looking surprised. "'With who? Why, the runaway nigger, of course. Who'd you reckon?' Tom looks at me very grave, and says, "'Tom, didn't you just tell me he was all right? Hasn't he got away?' "'Him?' said Aunt Sally. "'The runaway nigger? Deed he hasn't. They got him back, safe and sound, and he's in that cabin again, on bread and water, and loaded down with chains till he's claimed or sold.' Tom rose square up in bed, with his eye hot, and his nostrils opening and shutting like gills, and sings out to me. They ain't no right to shut him up. Shove! And don't you lose a minute. Turn him loose. He ain't no slave. He's as free as any creature that walks this earth. What does the child mean? I mean every word I say, Aunt Sally, and if somebody don't go, I'll go. I've knowed him all his life, and so is Tom there. Old Miss Watson died two months ago, and she was ashamed she ever was going to sell him down the river, and said so and she set him free in her will. Then what on earth did you want to set him free for, since he was already free? Well, that is a question, I must say, and just like women. Why, I wanted the adventure of it, and I'd a waited neck deep in blood to— Goodness alive! Aunt Polly! If she weren't standing right there, just inside the door— looking as sweet and contented as an angel half full of pie, I wish I may never. Aunt Sally jumped for her, and most hugged the head off of her, and cried over her, and I found a good enough place for me under the bed, for it was getting pretty sultry for us, seemed to me. And I peeped out, and in a little while Tom's Aunt Polly shook herself loose and stood there, looking across at Tom over her spectacles kind of grinding him into the earth, you know. And then she says, "'Yes, you better turn your head away. I would if I was you, Tom.' 
"'Oh, dearie me,' says Aunt Sally. "'Is he changed so? Why, that ain't Tom. It's Sid. Tom's—Tom's—' Tom's. Why, where is Tom? He was here a minute ago.' "'You mean where's Huck Finn? That's what you mean. I reckon I hain't raised such a scamp as my Tom all these years not to know him when I see him. That would be a pretty howdy-do. Come out from under that bed, Huck Finn.' So I done it, but not feeling brash. Aunt Sally, she was one of the mixed upest looking persons I ever see, except one, and that was Uncle Silas, when he come in and they told it all to him. It kind of made him drunk, as you may say, and he didn't know nothing at all the rest of the day, and preached a prayer meeting sermon that night that gave him a rattling reputation, because the oldest man in the world couldn't have understood it. So Tom's Aunt Polly, she told all about who I was and what, and I had to up and tell how I was in such a tight place that when Mrs. Phelps took me for Tom Sawyer, she chipped in and says, Oh, go on and call me Aunt Sally. I'm used to it now, and tain't no need to change. That when Aunt Sally took me for Tom Sawyer, I had to stand it. There wa not no other way. And I knowed he wouldn't mind, because it would be nuts for him, being a mystery, and he'd make an adventure out of it, and be perfectly satisfied. And so it turned out, and he let on to be Sid, and made things as soft as he could for me. And his Aunt Polly, she said Tom was right about old Miss Watson setting Jim free in her will. And so, sure enough, Tom Sawyer had gone and took all that trouble and bother to set a free nigger free. And I could never understand before, until that minute and that talk, how he could help a body set a nigger free with his bringing up. Well, Aunt Polly, she said that when Aunt Sally wrote to her that Tom and Sid had come all right and safe, she says to herself, Look at that now. I might have expected it, letting him go off that way without anybody to watch him. So now I got to go and traipse all the way down the river, eleven hundred mile, and find out what that creature's up to this time as long as I couldn't seem to get any answer out of you about it. "'Why, I never heard nothing from you,' says Aunt Sally. "'Well, I wonder why I wrote you twice to ask you what you could mean by Sid being here. "'Well, I never got him, sis.' Aunt Polly, she turns around slow and severe, and says, "'You, Tom!' "'Well, what?' he says, kind of pettish. Don't you what me, you impudent thing? Hand out them letters. What letters? Them letters. I be bound if I have to take a hold of you, I'll... They're in the trunk. There now. And they're just the same as they was when I got them out of the office. I hain't looked into em, I hain't touched them, but I knowed they'd make trouble, and I thought if you weren't in no hurry, I'd... Well, you do need skinning. There ain't no mistake about it. And I wrote another one to tell you I was coming, and I suppose he— No, it come yesterday. I hain't read it yet, but it's all right. I've got that one. I wanted to offer to bet two dollars she hadn't, but I reckon maybe it was just as safe to not to. So I never said nothing. End of chapter This here is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter The Last That means the last chapter. The first time I catched Tom Private, I asked him what was his idea, time of the evasion, what it was he planned to do if the evasion worked all right, and he managed to set a nigger free that was already free before, and he said what he had planned in his head from the start, if we got Jim out all safe, was for us to run him down the river on the raft, and have adventures plumb to the mouth of the river, and then tell him about his being free and take him back up home on a steamboat in style, and pay him for his lost time, 
and write word ahead and get out all the niggers around and have them waltz him into town with a torchlight procession and a brass band and then he would be a hero and so would we but i reckon it was about as well the way it was we had jim out of the chains in no time and when aunt polly and uncle silas and aunt sally found out how good he helped the doctor nurse tom they made a heap of fuss over him and fixed him up prime and gave him all he wanted to eat and a good time and nothing to do and we had him up to the sick room and had a high talk and tom give jim forty dollars for being prisoner for us so patient and doing it up so good and jim was pleased most to death and busted out and says there now huck what i tell you what i tell you up there in jackson island i told you i got a hairy breast and what's the sign of it and i told you i've been rich once and going to be rich again and it's come true and here she is there now don't talk to me signs is signs mind i tell you and i know just as well as i's going to be rich again as i's a standin' here this minute and then tom he talked along and talked along and says let's all three slide out of here one of these nights and get an outfit and go for howlin' adventures amongst the injuns over in the territory for a couple of weeks or two and i says all right that suits me but i ain't got no money for to buy the outfit and i reckon i couldn't get none from home because it's likely pap's been back before now and got it all away from judge thatcher and drunk it up no he ain't tom says it's all there yet six thousand dollars and more and your pap ain't ever been back since hadn't when i come away anyhow jim says kind of solemn he ain't a-comin back no more huck i says why jim never mind why huck but he ain't comin back no more but i kept at him so at last he says don't you remember the house that was floatin down the river and there was a man in there covered up and i went in and uncovered him and didn't let you come in well then you can get your money when you wants it cause dat was him tom's most well now and got his bullet around his neck on a watch guard for a watch and is always seein what time it is and so there ain't nothin more to write about and i am rotten glad of it because if i'd a known what a trouble it was to make a book I wouldn't a tackled it, and ain't a going to no more. But I reckon I got to light out for the territory ahead of the rest, because Aunt Sally she's going to adopt me and civilize me, and I can't stand it. I've been there before. That's the end of this here book. Thanks for listening.